Continuing the Star Wars review series, it's the section I've been waiting to get to, the original trilogy. Right now, we're going to do Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. Let's do this. Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, or just Star Wars, stars Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and is directed by George Lucas. What's up, guys? I can't believe it. We're actually at the original trilogy now. If you want to check out my previous Star Wars reviews, I've been doing them in timeline order. I just finished up a Rogue One. I uh, got my Rogue One t-shirt on here. So now we're going to do A New Hope. And it, this one I was a little scared to do because, I mean, what do you say about a movie that's pretty much been everything's been said about star wars everybody has seen star wars either you love star wars and then you and you've seen it or you hate star wars and you've still probably seen it you know this is one of those movies that like almost everyone has seen uh or at least everybody my age and maybe in their 30s 20s you know star wars you know if it wasn't for this movie then we would not be here uh this is the movie that started it all so i think i will definitely focus on some of the story points um but i'm definitely going to talk about a lot of behind the scenes type stuff a lot of personal memories of star wars what got me into it uh you know all kinds of stuff so i guess really starting from my history with star wars because this was the movie that really got me into the series a, a big shout out a friend of mine ken donnell I first came in the military back in 92, and uh, I, I was stationed in Tyndall in 94, Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. And it's, it's near Panama City. And that's where I first met Kenny Donnell. And like a lot of Star Wars fans, Ken was a massive one. You know, Star Wars was his bread and butter, is his bread and butter. And uh, it, it, the, the series means so much to him. And at the time, I was just like a casual Star Wars fan. Uh, but he was kind of the catalyst for really getting me into the series. Uh, and I remember after me and him became good friends, I went out and uh, I, I rented the VHSs. Yeah, I went to the local video store and rented all three of these VHSs. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, this is the original version to the unaltered version. And I, I was hooked, M myself and my wife. We both started watching all three of these movies and just, we were really into the story. And I think that's one of the reasons why Star Wars works so well is because at its core, you know, it's about dreams, hope and dreams. This young boy, Luke Skywalker, he doesn't know much about his past. And this old hermit, Obi-Wan Kenobi, comes and takes Luke Skywalker under his wings. And he's really kind of forced... Uh, to learning the ways of the uh, Jedi, the Force. He wanted to learn the ways of the Force, but he was forced into it because the Empire killed his aunt and uncle. And so then, you know, he meets these great characters like Han Solo, Princess Leia. You know, you know the story. I don't really have to tell you the story. Everybody knows the story of Star Wars. But really at its core, that's why it works so well. It's just because of the great characters and a great story. And it's just so relatable. You know, everybody can relate to... Finding your destiny, you know, what are we all meant to be? You know, everybody, we think like that when we're, when we're children, like, what am I going to do with my life? Where am I going to go? We all want to be great. We all want to be uh, something special. And, you know, Star Wars really taps into that, you know, and Star Wars is just really fun. You know, at its core, Star Wars is just a blast. And if I could recommend something, I, I can't recommend the documentary Empire of Dreams enough because if you want to know the story of the, the original trilogy start to finish, pretty much all the way up to George Lucas doing the, uh, the prequel trilogy, Empire of Dreams covers it all. I've watched it numerous times. It's such a well put together documentary. But the Star Wars trilogy didn't just change the way we look at movies. It changed the way that movies are made. You must unlearn what you have learned. There's so many accomplishments that George has done that really has changed the business as we know it. And uh, I, like I said, I can't recommend it enough. 
I don't think it's on any of the newer releases because one thing about Star Wars is with the new home video releases, they, they tend to not carry over all of the special features. So it kind of forces you to keep your old uh, releases. Like these VHSs right here. This really is the only way that you can get the unaltered edition. Um, at least up until they came out with the 2006 editions, which I have those two. And I know I'm already getting into this, the, uh, the special edition and the unaltered edition. You know what? Let's just jump into that. Why do people get so angry when it comes to these editions of the movies? Well, I can tell you why. Because I, I watched the special editions again recently. The A New Hope has the most changes. It really does. And a lot of those changes I don't mind. Uh, you know, I think the big thing is with CGI, as uh, time goes by, CGI dates itself. Practical effects, not as much, I don't think. But I still, I don't mind these special editions. You know, it's George Lucas's movie. He wanted to make the movie that was in his head. But when he made this movie, he didn't have access to the technology that he wanted so that's why he wanted to finish his vision you know most directors can't do this they put out their movie and then they go on with their lives but star wars is george lucas's life and so that's why he ended up you know tinkering with it constantly every edition of the movie that would come out he would update it you know even like in the prequel trilogy he updates yoda and, and you know some of these are great and some of them i think are needless but really at its core, the big reason why people are so pissed about this is because George Lucas doesn't want you to be happy. He doesn't want you to have the best quality version. Or he didn't. He doesn't own Star Wars anymore. But he didn't want you to have the best quality version of the unaltered original trilogy. That's what drove fans crazy. And it drove fans so crazy too because it was easily accessible. There is a version called Harmy's Despecialized Editions, which are pretty much HD 1080p versions of the original trilogy. You can get them right right now online. Go look for them. They're there. Um, but Harmy proved that anybody can actually make these, these versions of the unaltered editions, you know, in the best quality possible. So why wouldn't George Lucas do it? You know, why would he give us just a scan from a Laserdisc version, it's really kind of a, a jab at the fans, you know, like, screw you, I'll do whatever I want to. And I think that's where that, that whole controversy comes from. But in a way, in a negative way, it's kind of smart because you know what? It keeps Star Wars relevant. I think because of all these new additions and every time Star Wars comes on home video, it brings it back up again. You know, it's like Star Wars, it's constantly in our conscious because there's always something going on with the brand. Even more so now. You know, I think George Lucas did it right back, you know, when the original trilogy came out and the prequel trilogy because he released the movies every three years. So there was some breathing room there. Now with the Disney version of Star Wars, with the Kathleen Kennedy version of Star Wars, they got this product that was paced very well from you know, a, a releasing and marketing standpoint, and they just wanted to put it out, put it out, put it out constantly, just year after year after year. And uh, I, I think that's why we're in the, the state that we're in now. You know, I think that's why we ended up getting The Last Jedi. But anyway, back to Star Wars. I know I went off on a rant here there, because you can do that with Star Wars, but especially this first movie. But um, really to pronounce the characters in Star Wars, uh, you know, Luke Skywalker, played by Mark Hamill, you know, I've talked about how relatable he is. Um, and, you know, he's still, he's still just a young boy. He's very naive throughout this whole thing. But he's not so naive that we find him annoying. I think Mark Hamill captured that sense of innocence perfectly with the character of Luke. And I think that's why you root for him so much throughout uh, pretty much the, the whole trilogy. And then Harrison Ford, who plays Han Solo, this was really just a, a carpenter. This was a guy that was just a fill-in uh, until George Lucas could find his actor to play Han Solo. But he did such a great job at it that George ended up giving him the part. And really, to me, Han Solo is what every guy wants to be. You know, he's what every girl wants to be with. You know, Han Solo is just, he's the bad boy. He's the smuggler. He doesn't give a, a crap about anything. Uh, you know, you have the scene with Greedo uh, when we first meet him in the cantina scene. 
You know, that's who Han Solo is. He will kill you in a heartbeat. I don't care what anybody says. Han shot not only first, but he only shot. Greedo never even shot. And that was one of the biggest crimes of the special edition was changing it so Greedo shot first. That was stupid. That's not who Han Solo is. Han Solo uh, acts first, thinks later. That's the essence of the character. And, it, you know, he really shines in this movie, but he really shines in Empire actually so i'm looking forward to delving more into han solo in empire because there's some great iconic scenes in that movie that involve that character and then princess leia you have to give carrie fisher some major credit because she was like one of the first that i remember anyway badass women you know she was not a damsel in distress at all they were going to rescue her you know luke skywalker and han solo were going to pick her up but uh as soon as they met her, they realized this is not somebody that needs saving, you know. She was a tough character. And she had this, like, edge to her, you know, in her delivery. I think Carrie Fisher had to be the actress that played Princess Leia because that is Carrie Fisher. You know, she was this, like, smart-ass type of person. And I think you needed that for Leia. And really, she bounces off of Han so well, actually, because they're constantly, like, bickering at each other, you know. But... That sexual chemistry is just so palpable between the two. And it gets really awkward in this movie when, you know, knowing what you know about Luke Skywalker, that Luke had the hots for his sister. Now we're going to talk about Darth Vader. I just recently watched this again, you know, for, I've probably watched Star Wars, you know, a million times. Three movies that I watch the most, Halloween, Jaws, Star Wars. And the reason that Darth Vader is one of the most iconic villains of all time is because he's paced so well in Star Wars. You know, he's not overpronounced. Uh, he's really only in the movie, you know, just a matter of minutes. He's not in Star Wars that much. Most of this movie revolves around Luke, Han, and Leia. But every time Darth Vader comes into frame, the room stops. He's just that type of character. He commands respect. And one of my favorite scenes with Vader is uh, when he's talking to uh, the Admiral. And Tarkin's sitting there. And the Admiral, you know, he... He says, do not put your faith in, you know, the, the force. And, you know, mid-sentence, Vader, you know, shuts him right up with just like a gesture of his finger. That's a badass villain. That is a villain that's not overselling it. And I think the big mistake a lot of villains make these days, and even then, back, back then, were, you know, trying to come on too strong, you know, trying to scream how badass they are. And you don't have to do that. But it's a fine line, you know. What do you do if you can't do that? George Lucas knew how to create a great villain, and, and that's what Vader was. And then you got Obi-Wan Kenobi, the, the great mentor of Luke Skywalker. Really, Luke would not be where he ends up without Obi-Wan Kenobi. You know, this is the guy that guided him. Told, and, you know, that iconic scene where he tells him about his father. You know, they played that pretty delicately, too, because when you, when you know what you know about Darth Vader, that he is his father, when you go back and watch that scene, you're like, how in the hell did I not put two and two together? From a writing standpoint, George Lucas handled that very delicately, and I think he did it very well. But now let's talk about the fun of Star Wars, the magic of Star Wars. Why does it work so well? You know, put yourself in 1977. Science fiction films before Star Wars were like 2001. Uh, you had Star Trek on television. But no one had seen a world like Star Wars. From the opening scene, when you see that Star Destroyer, and it's just going on forever. Uh, it feels larger than life. You really feel like you're in space. That, you know, it's, it's like a camera is pointed right up to space. The ships feel so real. And these were all just models. You know, there, were, there was no like CGI. They had blue screen, but they had to use models in front of blue screen. And it's amazing that they were able to pull it off. And as a matter of fact, if I can step back, like think about it. Star Wars never should have worked. This is something that they address in Empire of Dreams too. You know, George Lucas had a nervous breakdown when he made this movie. Uh, Star Wars was really saved in the editing room. There wasn't like an ounce of footage outside of what we see that was usable. And when George Lucas saw like the first rough cut of Star Wars, he thought for sure that this was going to be his, his end. This was going to be a huge failure. He was going to be, you know, fry cooking somewhere after this movie because every limit that could be reached 
was reached with Star Wars. From a budget standpoint, from like a, a timeline standpoint, George Lucas was constantly buying time, trying to get this thing made, begging for another week, you know, just because everything was falling apart. You know, he would go and, and uh, look at the progress of the models, the ships, and nothing was getting done. And so Lucas had to really take matters into his own, ha own hands at some point. And I guess, you know, if anything, that's just a testimony to what it takes to be a good leader. A director has to be a good leader. You know, he has to crack the whip sometime and, and uh, you know, tell his, his actors, his crew members, we need to get this shit done. So luckily he was able to do that. It put him in the hospital, but still, we got Star Wars. But even like up to the theatrical release of this movie, you know, they thought for sure that this was going to be this big bomb. It was really released like with a double feature of, I think, like Smoking the Bandit or something like that. And, uh, it, you know, nobody expected Star Wars to be this big hit. And the very first weekend that it came out, you know, everybody's seen that iconic image of Man's Chinese Theater. And just, it looks like hundreds of people outside the theater. There was a movement before Star Wars even came out. Luckily, you know, this was some of the first, like, Comic-Con conventions. And these conventions really were promoting Star Wars before it was released. So they were already building a brand, building an audience through conventions, through action figures, through all this stuff. And, uh, you know, Star Wars became this massive hit. It was a big word of mouth hit. But, I mean, what else can you say about Star Wars? I mean, as far as a movie goes, it's a great movie. Like I said, it's, it's a great coming-of-age film. Uh, you know, there's just a sense of wonder there. It does what movies are supposed to do, especially summer movies. And uh, you, you could pick it apart. The, the scene with Obi-Wan Kenobi fighting Darth Vader, let's call a spade a spade. Not the best lightsaber fight in the, uh, the whole saga. But it's so short and it's there to do what it's supposed to do. You know, Obi-Wan Kenobi knew that he was pretty much, his time was at an end. So he pretty much just gave up. Gave, not really gave up, but gave his life for Luke. Plus, he was going to come back as a ghost anyway, so who cares? So anyway, uh, my, you have to give Star Wars a trapped on an island, right? Like, it's one of the, the movies that's, like, a must-see. There's a reason why we're still talking about Star Wars to this day. And I'm really looking forward to talking about Empire Strikes Back, which happens to be one of my favorite films of all time. So anyway, guys, that's it for Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. Post in the comments. Let me know your thoughts on this one. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks, where we talk horror all day and every day, and on Fridays, we do free for all Fridays. Follow me at Drum Dums on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. If you like what I'm doing, hit that subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, and Drum Dum out.